I mean, you can find something wrong with anything. I believe there's some people, bless God, when they get, if, if they make it to heaven, they'll try to find something wrong with heaven. And we take jobs for granted. We take spouses for granted. We take people for granted. It's like the kid that gets that new gift, that new toy. they all excited, and after a while, they leave it laying by the wayside. I believe that way too many Christians have received the gift of God. And as we talked about this morning, they tried to live the Christian life, but they tried to do it in the flesh instead of letting the Spirit live it inside them. See, you're not strong enough to whip the devil. You want to know why some people start out and they go a while and they fall to the wayside or they fall into sin or they can't be faithful, they can't stay with the job, they can't stay with the stuff. It's because they're living for God, but they're doing it in the flesh instead of being led of the Spirit. Hey, the Bible said, be ye filled with the Spirit. And we preached about that all morning long. And the problem is we don't appropriate that Spirit. We don't get it into our lives. And we make salvation. Salvation, too common of a thing. And we take it for granted. Yeah, I'm saved, so what? How could anybody answer that about salvation? It ought to be the most amazing thing in your life. You ought to be amazed tonight. That there's a God in heaven that loves you. You ought to be amazed that there's a God that forgave you. You ought to be amazed how that he would shed his blood on the cross of Calvary. And become the lamb of your redemption. And change your life. And it ought to, I, but listen, we believe that. And we accept it then. We turn around. Salvation's only a good thing. I don't read in there that it's a good thing. Salvation's a great thing. As a matter of fact, that ought to be the greatest thing that ever happened to you. You ought to never lose the thrill of being saved. Salvation ought to be the highest respect. Hey, listen, of all the things that you respect, you ought to respect the Lord Jesus and His salvation greater than anything else. And listen, if you really believe that, and if you really believe that salvation is the greatest thing that ever happened to you, then you can understand verse 1. See, until you understand that, verse 1 won't make any sense. <clears throat> verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard, lest at any time we'd let them slip. If salvation's the greatest thing that ever happened to you, you wouldn't be taking chances with your testimony. Amen. Hey man, hey let me tell you something. When you first start driving, now with many of us that's been a few years back. But you started out driving, and man, you were so careful. Uh, everything you do had to be just right. You watch the road, and you realize uh, the danger was out there. But after you've been driving about 50 years, like most of us have, then you don't have to pay attention to what you're doing. Pass by a friend, you turn all the way around the seat, waving at him, and driving that way, and waving that way. Or right. right, let me get you young people. Let me hang you. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Old people too. Yeah, the old people too. Man, I couldn't text if I wanted to. It'd take me all day to find the keys to spend it. I just bless God and tell you what I want. Like somebody said the other day, they said, you know, Technology has come so far. They got this thing now. You can speak into the little technological thing and it will text out what you say. And then when somebody gets it, it'll speak back to them. When they told me that, I said, does Alexander Graham Bale know that? <laughs> That's the way it used to be. It was called telephone. Yeah. But wait a minute. We take things for granted about driving, about jobs, about marriage. 
and we take all that same thing over into our spiritual life because you got to be honest uh, if you really appreciated what God had done for you and if you had not lost the thrill you would never let anything slip you would dot every I you would cross every T you would be so excited about the fact that you're on your way to heaven uh, and you missed out on hell you're going to get to see him face to face one day and to be able to live uh, in the glory world uh, but the problem is uh, you might be saved uh, but you got to the point that you're taking salvation for granted oh, salvation is only a good thing to most people the Bible doesn't call it a good thing it calls it a great thing I'll eventually get to a few points notice verse 2 for if the word was spoken by angels and it was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just, a just recompense of reward how you think you're going to escape he's talking about people rejecting salvation and he goes on about midway of verse 3 talks about that it first began to be spoken of by the Lord and it was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. And then it said, God bore witness, listen to this, with signs, with wonders, with divers miracles, the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Having said that, I want to give you a few quick points. And I want to talk to you about tonight why your redemption is the greatest thing. And why we ought to call it great. I'm going to say to you, first of all, number one tonight, it's great because of the price. It's great because of the price. You say, Brother Sam, I've caught you in a contradiction. I heard you preach a few a week or two back, and you said, uh, you quoted that old song, In my hand no price I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Yeah, let me tell you, uh, there is no price for you to pay. But that does not mean that there was no price. I'm just glad while there was a price, uh, the price has already been paid. Uh, there was a God that looked down to heaven, uh, and he saw you on your way to hell, uh, and he carried enough about you that he interceded uh, on your behalf and came uh, and came into this world uh, to live a sinless life and become the lamb of your redemption Amen. Lord have mercy I think it ought to be great because of the price let me tell you about the price oh it's not for you to pay it's not I'm not talking about putting a, a quarter in the offering pan I'm not talking about paying your way into heaven. I'm talking about the price that was already paid. That is what makes it great. First of all, it cost Jesus his blood. It cost him his body. And then it cost him his being. And how can we look at salvation as a common or an ordinary thing when the price was that great? Listen, all the way through the Old Testament, the only way that God ever overlooked sin, the only way that God ever forgave sin, there had to be blood that was shed. Not trying to take you back too much to the Old Testament, but that old priest, when he went into the tabernacle and went in there to the Ark of the Covenant, and he had, see, God looked out of heaven. There was a box about the size of this communion table. Kind of, kind of looked like a coffin, had a lid on it. Inside it were the broken tablets. And when God looked down out of heaven, he saw the broken tablets. And it reminded God that mankind was nothing but a bunch of sinners. So when the high priest went in there, he had to take the blood of a lamb. And he had to catch that blood in a basin and when he went up there he would reach in there and put that blood on the top of the ark of the covenant called the mercy seat and the only way that Israel could ever be forgiven it was because some innocent lamb had to die so 
know the Israelites would not have to die. The only reason Sam Duncan's going to live forever in the glory world is because there was a God that looked down from heaven and he said, I will become the Lamb and I'll shed his blood. How in the name of heaven can we get not be excited over salvation? It's not a good thing. It's a great thing. It's great. Because of the price. Because Jesus' is blood. Hallelujah. Then it cost him his body. Look, folks, we got this fine looking cross. Let me catch my breath. We got this fancy, nice looking cross. The original cross of Calvary wasn't anything pretty to look at. Old rough beams. The person on it sliding up and down. Got long splinters that long in their back. Their back had already been beaten with a rod and a cat of nine tails. And Jesus is nailed to the cross. You know the story. And I know it's not quite Easter. But the Bible said he looked up toward heaven. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The Bible said he gave up the ghost. He said, no man taketh my life from me, but I lay it down freely. And if I lay it down freely, I'll have the power to take it back up again. He gave his body. He was hanging on the cross. He looked at the unseen to the human eye. There's the death angel. And Jesus said, come get me. Come get me. That old death angel looking at the cross said, Aye, aye, sir. Jesus didn't die a defeated foe. He commanded that death angel. And the Bible said that he gave up the ghost. They didn't take the ghost from him. He gave up the ghost. That chin hit his chest and he quit breathing. They took that life and limp body down off the cross and buried it in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. It cost Jesus his blood. It cost Jesus his body. And it cost Jesus his being. He died. He wasn't passed out. He wasn't in some swoon. He died. As dead as any corpse has ever been at Jim's funeral home. It cost him. And yet we look at it as, oh well. Okay. Oh, I was excited about it when I got saved, but okay. Well, so and so would you pray, yeah. <gasps> Well, so and so, would you do this, that, and the other? Um, preacher, I just don't know. I, I, I was thinking about watching a bowl game. You just got in my way. How in the name of heaven, if salvation is a great thing to you, that goofing off and messing around means more. The only way that it means more to you than God, you have lessened your opinion of salvation. Across the board, somebody say amen. amen. First of all, number one, it's great because of its price. Number two, it's great because of its power. Amen. Let me tell you something. Few of you I knew for you got saved. A few of you knew me for I got saved. Come on. Can I announce to you tonight there's transforming power Amen. in salvation. Amen. Let me tell you something. You can go to 400 uh, dry out clinics and get out and then you want to drink on the way home. Amen. You can go to drug rehab places, spend weeks or months and get out and get high before you get back to the house. But let me tell you right now, when the transforming power of the blood of Jesus comes on to your life, it will change you. Uh, honey, it's no longer what you do. It changes your nature on the inside so that you don't want that stuff anymore. Somebody say amen. I'm telling you, it's the greatest thing that has ever been. It's greater than any politician. It's greater than any movie star. It's greater than any amount of money. Honey, 
you know to be the greatest thing. Salvation's not something good. Salvation's something great. Because of the transforming power. I go all day on the transforming power. I changed you and it changed you and it changed you. And it changed me. But not only is it great because of the transforming power, it's great because of the tranquilizing power. Say, so, Brother Sam, what are you talking about? Me sleeping at church? No. When I say the tranquilizing power, whenever a demon of hell gets on your mind and it tries to run you crazy, and listen, I said it this morning, I'll say it again. It's true that even Christians sometimes get depressed. Yeah, Amen. Yeah. And when something is beating you down and it's running you crazy, it's eating you alive. I'm glad that I can go back to the cross of Calvary and I can look and see what God has done for me and see not only the transforming power, but the tranquilizing power. He'll just smooth everything out and get you back at peace. Mister, that's something there's no single prescription in any drugstore can give you the peace that God through the Holy Ghost can give to you. Man, those people are completely spaced out. Amen. They're tranquilized the wrong kind of way. Amen. And I'm glad when I get worried, when I get upset, when I have problems, I'm glad for the power Amen. that comes through salvation. How can we look at it as anything but a great thing? Amen. It's great because of its price. It's great because of its power. It's great because of its provision. Amen. Listen, I've never had anybody provide that much for me. Well, my parents did as a kid, of course. I don't mean uh, that. But I mean, as being an adult and being a man of my own, I've never, and I'm not pulling off on anybody, and I'm not poking fun, but I've never laid back and let the government keep me up. Amen. They've never provided anything for me. I've never been anybody else that's done anything for me. It's been scratch and get what I could I, down through my life. But let me tell you right now, when I got saved, uh, that provided uh, a home for me like you can't ever believe. Hey, I'm going to tell you something I don't usually tell too many people. Back years and years and years and more years ago, I was out in California. I wasn't with Dink, though, that's for sure. But I'm going to tell you what I did do, Dink. Thought it was some big thing. Took one of those tours of the Stars homes. Of course, the Stars back in that day was, uh, well, Roy Rogers. <laughs> he probably was, but I was trying to say, I was trying to say Clint Eastwood. I've been to Clint's house. Didn't go in, but I've been to Clint Eastwood's house. Carol Burnett. And I'm going to tell you this, and don't pull a rock at me. I even made a picture of Sonny and Cher's home. You even know who Sonny and Cher would be? Sonny's dead, and Cher might as well be. Amen. <laughs> No, nah, just listen to me. I've seen some, I don't know how many million some of those houses were on the hillsides and palm trees and all that in Hollywood, California. Well, let me tell you right now, I got a home that's been provided for me by the fact that I'm saved that would make the White House look like an outhouse. I got something up there that's going to make the movie stars' homes look like garbage and trash. And that has been provided to me by the fact that I'm saved by the grace of God. Now, if that's real to you, if you've got a mansion waiting for you on the other side, how can salvation not be a great thing? To you? Well, I'm saved. I'm saved, but I'm not going to get excited about it. Bless your heart. Kick your rear. Somebody help me with an amen. Man, this provided a mansion. Let me tell you, 
I, I made mention of the fact this morning, and I, I'm not trying to talk about myself or my family or anything, but I made mention of the fact this morning that my dad died 36 years ago yesterday, March the 7th of 1979. But you know what? Through the fact that I'm saved, I've been provided access to heaven to meet up with the saints of God on the other side again. And my mother a few years back and many of the saints of God that have been here at our church, uh, one by one by one, God's called them on out. I mean, listen to me. Salvation has provided that. Now, if that's real to you, listen to me. If it's real to you that you really believe you're going to meet your mother, you're going to meet your father, you're going to meet your children or your grandchildren again, how can salvation not be the greatest thing the greatest thing that you could ever experience. Not just a good thing, but the greatest thing that has ever been. Man, it's great because of its price. It's great because of its power. It's great because of its provision. And then it's great because of its preparation. And I'm nearly finished. Let me tell you about how it was prepared. God the Father planned it. God the Son purchased it. And God the Holy Ghost presented it. Amen. Listen, salvation must be awfully important that the entire Godhead would be involved in bringing salvation to you. Man, God the Father planned it. I mean, back in the eons of eternity past, God the Father already knew what He was going to do. God the Son, the Lord Jesus, He came and purchased it, as I said a while ago, with His blood and His body and His being. Yes. And then God the Holy Ghost presented it. Think back for a minute. I'm not going to ask you to stand up and give a story, so don't get nervous. Think back for a minute where you were when the Holy Ghost rang your bell. I want you to remember. Think about it right now. Wherever you were, some of you, and if you don't remember now, I'm not saying you got to remember the date, the time, and all those. That's insignificant. But if you don't remember the time and the place that God rang your bell, it might be because you're not saved. I remember riding around with a bunch of old cronies in the back seat, passed by an old church building, and a bunch of crazy nuts go to talking about quote unquote religion. Amen. And if I can be so honest, riding around with beer in the car, I said, Lord, have mercy. Mr. The Holy Ghost wore me out, Brother Henry. Man, it's like he got that sword out and pinned me to that back seat. Back then, I wasn't near as bold as I am now. And I didn't know, I, I, but I, I, I backed up. I said, fellas, y'all take me home. I don't feel good. I tell you right now, it doesn't feel good to get under Holy Ghost conviction. He wore me out. And listen, because of that, tonight I'm saved by the grace of God. I remember when the Spirit came and presented salvation to me. I was going to slip in the back door. You know how people do. I went around, lived over there on that mill hill. I went through the backyard and went around to the back. Come on. I didn't get any further than those back door steps. I was under conviction. I mean, God's eating me alive. It was just like if I didn't get saved right then, I was doomed. Uh, mister, I fell down. I got gloriously born again that night by God's amazing grace on the back door steps. It might have been over. It might have been on the mill hill, but I'm glad that God the Father came down the golden staircase of glory and came down to Anderson and came down to 308 G Street and changed my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How in the name of heaven can salvation be up? There's people right now who are too lazy this morning to get their rear out of the bed and go to church for an 11 o'clock service. 
Lord, you are lazy if you're not out to bed time to make a living. But it's a funny thing. People get up and be at work at 7 a.m. on Monday. You tell me where your priority is. Amen. Salvation's not a bad thing. Salvation's not just a good thing. Salvation is a great thing. And if it's not great to you, I do some checking up. I'm going to have to tighten this up. Stay with me a few more minutes. Let me get a drink of water. And it's great because of its prospect. You say, what do you mean, Brother Sam? The prospect. And I want you to listen. I know it's a Sunday night crowd and we're all facing people sick and different things going on and here, this, that, and other. But let me tell you what salvation will do. First of all, it'll save, first, let me listen to me tonight, it'll save the ruined. Amen. You know, there was an old woman one time that went to a well to draw some water. The reason she came at an odd time, she couldn't go when the decent women went. This woman was same as what we call in our day a harlot. The Bible said that Jesus went up and sat down on the little rock wall around that well. And when that woman got there, he said, Ma'am, if you drink of that water, you'll thirst again. But if you drink of the water that I give you, you'll never thirst again. The Bible said, she said, Sir, give me that water. Well, he wasn't talking about that water. He's talking about that living water. And he preached to her. That woman got saved. You know what? It'll save the ruined. Secondly, it'll save the rich. You remember one time Jesus was coming to town and there was a rich fella. His name was Zacchaeus. The Bible said that when the Lord's coming to town and most Jews aren't real tall anyway, and he climbed up in that sycamore tree. Every little kid knows the story. And he wanted to see Jesus. And as Jesus walked by, he stopped and looked up at him. I don't know how high he was. He might not have been just barely off the ground. He could have been as high as that speaker. Jesus looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down. Hallelujah. I believe he skipped the bark off the tree. <laughs> he came down. He went to his house. Listen. The prospect of salvation, it'll save the ruined. It'll save the rich. It'll save the religious. There's a whole lot of religious people need saving. What about old Nicodemus? You remember Nicodemus? The Bible said he came to Jesus by night. He's been knocked and made fun of for trying to sneak around and find out with Jesus at night. But it might have been he got under conviction and couldn't wait till tomorrow. And he went and found Jesus. And Jesus spoke to him about being born again. He said, how can I go back to my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said, art thou not a ruler of the Jews? And knowest not these things? And old Nicodemus got saved. Amen. Let me tell you, tell you the prospect of salvation. It'll save the ruined. It'll save the rich. It'll save the religious. And let me tell you, it'll save the rebellious. Amen. Quickly, and I know I've got to hurry. The Lord told a story in the Bible about this young man. He said, I can see him right now stomping his foot. He said, nobody going to tell me what to do. I'm going to leave home and join the Marine Corps. <laughs> no, he said, I'm going to leave the house. I'm going to go to a faraway country. And he did. And everything he touched went sour. Wasted everything he had. And the Bible actually says he wasted his substance on riotous living. Later on, we read a little further on down in the chapter that he wasted it with harlots and all kinds of you know, ungodly living. And the Bible said that finally that old boy came to himself. Aren't you glad there was a night you came to yourself? Aren't you glad that all of a sudden your mind popped open and you realized that living that kind of lifestyle was pure and sheer stupidity? And aren't you glad that your mind 
opened up. He came to himself. He said, how many of the servants in my father's house have plenty to eat and to spare? And here I am, I'm his son, and I'm perishing with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me one of your hired servants. And he started to own the whole Wait a minute, that old boy might have rehearsed it, but he never got to make his speech. Quickly, in my mind, I see an old man sitting on the old country porch. Maybe in a rocking chair. That boy's been gone so long, he thinks he's dead. There's no cell phones and no texting and no email. and He hadn't heard from the boy and thinks he's dead. Because the Bible said that the daddy thought that. He said, this is my son who was dead and is alive again later on. He looked up and he saw that old boy coming down that long, wide road. That old man forgot about his age. He forgot about that bad back. He forgot about all of his health problems. He jumped over the banister railing. Ran out there and fell on his neck. Had kissed him, and the old boy started a little speech, and the daddy hushed him up. He shouted back, bring the best robe and put on him. Bring some shoes and put on his feet. Kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party. Put a ring on, on his finger. Listen, it'll save even the rebellious. In case you haven't noticed, all these things started with R. That was tough coming up with all those. I had to wear Webster, Mr. Webster out. It'll save the ruin, it'll save the rich, it'll save the religious, it'll save the rebellious, and then the last category, it'll save the rest. Amen. Whosoever will, Amen. let him come. Wait a minute. Something that'll do all that, and I haven't scratched the surface of salvation tonight, but just what I've said, if that's not enough for you to make salvation your greatest, highest priority, you'd have a hard time proving to some people that you're saved. If salvation is a experience. Or if you think more of some television show than you do God. I'm not being unreasonable. I'm just thinking about what we've just talked about tonight in one short message, what all God's done. If He's not great, not just good, certainly not bad, but if He's not great, He identifies this when He's talking to lost people. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Have you been like a kid Christmas. When you got the gift of salvation, were you all thrilled about it? And then three or four or five days later, well, oh well. Glad I nailed that down. Now let me go on about my business. If that's your attitude, something's not right. Amen. What do you think about salvation tonight? Do you think it's a good thing? It's a great thing. What do you think about it now? Brother Larry, what do you think about salvation tonight? Hey, Amen. Brother Greg, what's salvation to you, brother? That's a great thing. Brother Tommy, what is it, brother? It's a great thing. Brother Donnie, what's salvation? Hey, Amen. So listen, don't try to pass it off as being some minor thing it's the best thing that ever could have happened to you in a million years and we take it so much for granted and we let things slip when we should let's pray our father did not I thank you Lord for the opportunity to be in your house and Lord, I think sometimes, I know you don't send sickness, but sometimes I believe even a sickness can make you appreciate things a little better. I appreciate the opportunity to 
preach tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to be in your house. And Lord, I don't ever want to take for granted what you've done for me. Lord, I realize you didn't owe me anything. And I owe you everything. And I just pray tonight, God, that we would get this in perspective, that we wouldn't even look at salvation as being a good thing. But as the Scripture says, that it would be in our minds a great thing. Forgive us, God, if we've taken it one ounce for granted. There's been a time we didn't pray like we should, and we didn't go out on visitation like we said we would, and we didn't witness like we said we would, and we lost our thrill like we said we wouldn't. I ask you, God, to forgive us. In Jesus' name, do a work in every heart and life. Or there may be somebody here tonight that needs that salvation. But my guess tonight is that most people that would be here on a Sunday night are probably saved. But Lord, only you know. But I do pray for those of us that are saved that we would never take it for granted. We'd never let these things slip. And salvation would always be a great, great thing. In Jesus' name, amen.